Welcome to Sidebar, a podcast from Courthouse News. I'm your host, Hillel Aaron, and I'm joined today by Kirk McDaniel, bringing us a story about the wild and woolly world of pet law. The do's, the don'ts, and the does. Hey, Kirk, you seem like a guy that would have a pet. You are correct. Two dogs and a fish. What about you? No, no pets, unless you count my five-year-old son, who, you know, is a lot like having a pet with opinions. I did have a pet rabbit once, uh, which was a complete nightmare. It chewed everything in sight, urinated on the couch habitually. Um, uh, You know, it's funny, though. uh, Most animals really don't want to be pets. In fact, you could argue that dogs are really the only animals that are fully domesticated. And even then, mine barely like to act domesticated. But that doesn't stop people from trying. What does stop them? Why? The law, of course. Now, Kirk, you live in Texas. Uh, I assume there's nothing you can't do, right? You can have a pet monkey who owns a submachine gun. I've never heard of anything like that before, but having lived in Texas my whole life, I have learned not to be surprised. Well, let's get into it. Kirk, take it away. According to the United States Census Bureau, around 60 million American households have pets. That is a ton of good boys and girls out there. It may or may not come as a surprise that Americans have more dogs than any other pet. Data from the American Veterinary Medical Association reveals that there are over 76 million dogs, 58 million cats, 7 million birds, and 1 million horses serving as companion animals as we speak. I don't need to rattle off numbers to tell you how important pets are to Americans. Just scroll through social media and you'll see pets with their own accounts, endless videos of dogs and cats acting cute and silly, and influencers selling pet food or treats that allow your pet to be their full self. Pets define us as people. They aid us in our daily lives and have become integral parts of our families. Dogs and cats have lived alongside humans for thousands of years. Our history is as much their history. But have you ever stopped and wondered about the laws that define pet ownership? Are there specific pets that you can't own where you live? How regulated is the pet trade? To answer all of these questions, I started looking into federal laws that impact pet ownership. One thing I didn't realize at first is there's a long, rich history of animal welfare activism in the United States. Over half a century ago, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Animal Welfare Act into law. This seminal piece of legislation was passed in response to public outcry over the ways animals were treated in laboratory testing. The act has since been amended to further protect more types of animals and how they're treated in public exhibitions, commercial trading, and during transportation. Getting the Animal Welfare Act passed was an accomplishment activists had worked for a long time. I think that with laws like the Animal Welfare Act, it helped cement this understanding that these are sentient beings, that they are capable of suffering, and that they need to be considered on their own merits and as having their own caretaking, as opposed to just a resource that can be used. Hi, my name is Kate Deluski. I'm Assistant Director of Government Affairs at the Animal Welfare Institute. And AWI is a nonprofit organization headquartered in DC that has been working to alleviate the suffering of animals for over 70 years now. The activism of the Animal Welfare Institute and other animal welfare organizations led to the passage of other important laws like the Endangered Species Act, which places federal protection over animal species that are threatened or in danger of becoming extinct. But when we're talking about the pet trade, the Animal Welfare Act is the most powerful federal tool to protect animals. The Animal Welfare Act does not cover everything. For instance, animals being used for food or for their hides, cold-blooded animals, fish, and invertebrates are not covered under the Animal Welfare Act. The Animal Welfare Act is far from perfect. It sets pretty minimal standards, for example, space requirements and veterinary requirements, but it is so much better than having no protections under the law. And we continue to fight to make sure that the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually understands and sees that the animals are supposed to be the clients here and are supposed to be the number one priority under this law. Deluski is not alone in her criticism of the USDA's enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act. 
My name is John Goodwin, and I'm the senior director of the Stop Puppy Mills campaign here at the Humane Society of the United States, uh, or HSUS. And I've been here at HSUS for 23 years. Puppy mills especially are an area in which John sees the need for further regulation to protect the welfare of dogs. What exactly is a puppy mill? A puppy mill is a commercial dog breeding kennel where the basic needs of the dogs are not being met. Think of a puppy factory farm. These are operations that will have 50, 100, maybe 200 dogs lined up in rows of cages. They view them as breeding machines and they just live a barren life in these cages being bred every heat cycle to produce the maximum number of puppies that can then be sold through pet stores or over the internet or even at flea markets. The USDA is responsible for monitoring some, but not all, puppy mills. Under the Animal Welfare Act, there are requirements that some puppy mills get a USDA license and follow minimal regulations. So if you have at least five breeding female dogs and you sell puppies either to pet stores for resale or over the internet shipping the puppies to people you never meet face to face, then you're supposed to get that USDA license. For some perspective, there are nearly 3,000 animal breeders licensed with the United States Department of Agriculture. So what does it mean to have a license, and how does the USDA enforce the standards set by the Animal Welfare Act? It means that you'll probably be inspected about once a year, and you have to adhere to some minimal survival standards. Now, those standards need to be upgraded significantly. Right now, under the USDA regulations, a puppy mill owner can keep a dog in a cage that is only six inches longer than her body. So that's grossly inadequate for a dog. They can breed them as many times as they want. They do this until the dog's bodies wear out, and then they're often killed. Uh, many of these dogs have spent their entire life standing on wire flooring that's allowed under the USGA regulations with their paws never touching a blade of grass. Now, I do want to draw a distinction between puppy mills and responsible dog breeders. There are a lot of people who have dogs and live in their home, and maybe they have a litter of puppies once a year. They're proud to show a customer the mother dog. They're proud to show a customer the conditions the mother dog lives in. That's very, very different than what we see with the puppy mills. So when we talk about should, you know, should puppy mills be abolished? Well, yeah, puppy mills should be abolished. But, but that doesn't mean that we get rid of dog breeding. It is important to note that these are just the federal standards that apply to puppy mill operations. Several states, including California, New York, Washington, and Illinois, have banned the sale of puppies and kittens in retail stores as a way to cut off the demand for puppies from such operations. The Animal Welfare Act is the first line of defense for many of the pets we welcome into our homes. While it's not perfect, it's all we have to protect these vulnerable creatures. Now, what about some of the more exotic pets out there? What about, I don't know, ferrets, hedgehogs, even monkeys? Most of what I know about pet law comes from the movie Big Lebowski. And also, let's not forget, let's not forget, dude, that keeping wildlife, um, an amphibious rodent for, um, you know, domestic within the city, that ain't legal either. What are you, a fucking park ranger now? So Kirk was Walter right? Well, depending on where you live, he could very well be right. As was mentioned before, the Animal Welfare Act is an important statute that protects animals being bred for selling, being experimented on, and being shown as part of an exhibition. However, talking about dogs and cats is very different than talking about lizards and tigers. Exotic animals can be anything from a tiny frog to a nearly 12-foot-long Burmese python. Exotic pets can be birds, reptiles, amphibians, and mammals. These animals are not domesticated and often still exhibit wild behavior. An important thing to understand is that the sale and trade of exotics is a state-by-state -state issue. Here's John Goodwin again from the Humane Society of the United States. That, that's true. And not only do we have the complexity of 50 states, but we have the complexity of hundreds of different species, maybe thousands of different species even, who 
that are being used in the exotic pet trade. So Al, uh, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, Wisconsin, those four states don't have any local law or state laws regulating what kind of exotic animals people can keep as pets, none at all. So it's the wild, wild west in some places like that. Kate Delewski from the Animal Welfare Institute. The Animal Welfare Institute's position on exotic pet ownership is very simple. Wild animals do not belong in anybody's home. It is cruel to the animals who have wild behaviors and instincts and needs that cannot be expressed in a setting that is so radically different from what would they they would experience in their natural habitat. And it's also incredibly dangerous. You know, people can get large, you know, venomous snakes. They can get other dangerous wild animals, primates. Uh, at least we finally got the big cat bill passed so that, you know, those Tiger King type characters won't be able to put a, you know, a tiger in a cage next door to your house because I don't think anyone wants that. What John is talking about there is the Big Cat Public Safety Act. A new bill is giving exotic animals new protections. President Biden signed the Big Cat Public Safety Act into law today, essentially banning the private ownership of lions, tigers, and other big cats. What this now law does is two things. It prohibits anybody from owning a big cat as a pet. So this is private individuals, not zoos or sanctuaries, but, you know, someone like you or me who thinks it would be a good idea to have a tiger in our house. And the other thing that it prohibits is allowing public contact with big cats, because a big part of the pipeline into pet ownership was some disreputable zoos breeding big cats incessantly to supply cubs for cub petting exhibits where you could hold them and bottle feed them, get your picture taken with them. And then those cubs would outgrow their use and they, some of them would be funneled into the pet trade. It's hard to separate the ownership of big cats, especially tigers, and not talk about the Tiger King himself, Joe Exotic. If you can think back to 2020, Early in the pandemic, the Netflix documentary series chronicled the sensational and erratic lifestyle of Exotic, whose legal name is Joseph Maldonado Passage, and his job as the owner and lead entertainer at a wildlife park in Oklahoma. I'm as gay as a $3 bill. I'm standing in a cage with five full-grown tigers in line. I asked Kate whether the Tiger King story helped rally advocates toward passing the Big Cat Public Safety Act. Tiger King was clearly a very dramatic, sensationalized piece of media. It contained a lot of inaccuracies and it failed to focus on the animal suffering that occurs in this industry at the expense of focusing on the human drama that was occurring. But there was an interesting silver lining to it, which is that it did open people's eyes to this industry. Suddenly people were aware that folks like Joe Exotic were operating these facilities that were offering cub petting, that were breeding big cats at an alarming rate, that were not at all concerned with the welfare of the animals. So suddenly it did become a lot easier to talk to people about the Big Cat Public Safety Act because there was this frame of reference like, oh, you're talking about a place like Joe Exotics. And I do think that inadvertently, (laughs) um, it did help become a catalyst for raising the type of awareness that we needed in order to get this bill done. Coming off of the success groups like the Humane Society of the U.S. and the Animal Welfare Institute had in getting the Big Cat Public Safety Act passed, they are now looking to pass a similar law, banning the private ownership of primates. Yeah, yeah, the Captive Primate Safety Act is a very important bill. Primates simply should not be kept as pets. They have complex needs that a private citizen is going to be very unlikely to be able to meet. 
people buy them thinking that they're going to be cute and cuddly and fun. And then these animals grow up, they reach sexual maturity, and they become territorial and aggressive. And people realize that they don't know how to deal with that. And so we'll lock them in cages for the rest of their lives. We'll keep them restrained. We'll sometimes surgically mutilate them by taking out their teeth or their nails. This is just an absolutely inexcusable way to treat an animal. On top of these issues concerning pet primates, they can also be very dangerous creatures and pose a risk to public safety. As an example of the dangers of primates being kept as pets, both John and Kate shared with me a story of Charla Nash. On February 16th, 2009, Charla Nash was at her friend's home in Stamford, Connecticut, when she was attacked by Travis, her friend's 200-pound pet chimpanzee. Nash, who was familiar with the monkey, was attempting to get Travis under control after he got out of the house. Travis ripped Charla's fingers, lips, nose, and eyelids off. When police arrived, an officer shot Travis four times. Travis fled and was later found dead next to his cage. Charla talked with Oprah Winfrey later that same year and talked about the attack and how she felt about people owning primates like Travis as pets. Tell me why you wanted to do the interview now. Well, I'm getting stronger and healthier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to put across the people's lives that these exotic animals are very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And they shouldn't be around. Mm -hmm. they, there's a place for them that it's not in residential areas, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. In the years since the attack, Charla has received a face transplant and has gone on to reclaim her life. However, the conversation surrounding the ownership of primates has waged on, and some states have even made the decision to ban ownership altogether. Every state has its own statute on this or not, and so some states ban primate ownership entirely, some ban the ownership of certain types of primates, some require you to get a license or to register the animal, and some have no laws or regulations whatsoever on this. Here in Texas, I was able to find online listings for small capuchin monkeys selling from $150 up to $400 each. And believe it or not, I even found some listings to buy baby chimpanzees for around four to $5,000. So far, the Captive Primate Safety Act has a long road ahead. Kate and John both believe that the law would significantly improve not only the animal welfare of primates in the United States, but improve public safety, preventing any person from suffering the way Charla did so many years ago. All right, we've talked about the more extreme exotic pets, but what about the more innocuous ones? In many states, people are free to own whatever animal they please. However, in some, you might be surprised to find that it is illegal to own specific animals. Take the state of California, for example. It is illegal to import thousands of animal species that pose a public safety health risk, are endangered, or carry the threat of displacing the native wildlife population. Gerbils are one such critter. These small rodents come from deserts in Africa and Asia. While not native to the US, they might find our deserts, like those found in Southern California, hospitable and worthy of a place to call home, leading to the spread of an invasive species. This threat is not just perceived. In some parts of America, it is an all out battle to contain animals that were once pets from driving the native population to extinction. Take, for example, the Burmese python that now calls the Florida Everglades home. In the 1980s, pythons from Southeast Asia exploded as a popular exotic pet. Some owners who grew tired or unable to care for their large exotic snakes would release them into the Everglades. Experts also believe that the population of Burmese pythons really took off 
after a python breeding facility was destroyed during Hurricane Andrew, which rocked the state of Florida in 1992. The population has gotten so out of hand that the state has declared open season on them, allowing them to be hunted year-round without a license or permit. To get a better understanding of why states would turn to such drastic measures, I reached out to someone who is on the front line of invasive species control. My name's Tim Pilot, and I'm the executive director at Armand Bayou Nature Center. Uh, Armand Bayou Nature Center is one of the largest urban wilderness preserves in the United States with more than 2,500 acres. It's not often that you hear the words urban and wilderness in the same sentence, but that is indeed what we are to our east and west. We have residential neighborhoods uh, where there's lots of houses with people with pets. And then uh, to our north, we are bordered by the Pasadena Petrochemical Complex. And then uh, to our south, uh, just right up right in our back door, we back right up to Johnson Space Center, so NASA. Growing up in Houston, I went to Armand Bayou Nature Center and remember learning about conservation and the invasive species that have taken root in the area. The species Tim and his team work to contain and remove from the Nature Center come in all forms, fish, reptiles, mammals, even plants. Tim told me about the brown anoles, little lizards originally from Cuba, that have in recent years become a formidable species, pushing out the green anoles native to southeast Texas. He even shared his experience spotting feral hogs on the property. An interesting note about these non-native hogs, these pigs were originally introduced to the West Indies by Christopher Columbus. They can and have been used as a shining example of a species run amok, causing tens of millions in property damage every year and ferociously consuming resources that native animals depend on. That is why in Texas, they are allowed to be hunted year-round you may have even seen viral videos of people using high-powered rifles to hunt them from helicopters. Whatever it takes, I guess. But while these species are seen as the go-to quintessential examples of invasive species, you may be surprised to learn that there are others much closer to home. Well, you know, we all love our dogs and cats. You know, we, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cat owner uh, myself. Uh, my, my, my pet, Lyosha, he's my favorite little, little, uh, little Russian blue. He was a, a, a stray that wandered up one day and now he lives in my house. He's, he's a great cat. But a lot of people don't recognize that our, our, our favorite little kitty cats are actually an invasive species. You heard that right, cats, as an invasive species. What happens is, you know, sometimes, you know, we let our, our cats out and about and wandering outside of our homes and, and then they they breed and then um, those cats are living out in the wild as, as, as feral animals. A lot of people don't don't really consider cats as an invasive species. They're they're cute and they're cuddly and we love them and we want to feed them and, and, and take care of them, but they're they are voracious hunters. Again, when a non-native species is introduced to an ecosystem, it has to compete with the other native species, relying on the same resources. And in the case of cats, Tim told me that birds suffer the most. And a feral cat who isn't having his diet supplemented by his owner's, you know, Purina cat chow, that cat can actually hunt, you know, and kill as many as 20 birds a day. There are certain areas of the world and island nations where, where there are certain small mammal and bird species that are completely extinct now because of the introduction of cats. And again, I love my kitty cat, but I don't let my cat wander around outside because it's really bad for the for the bird population. In fact, the, the songbird population in the United States has decreased by at least 40% over the last several decades. So, and, and some of that is due to habitat loss and some of that is due to other factors, you know, like windmills and, you know, airports and, and, and things like that. But by and large, the single largest anthropogenic cause for the decline of the songbird population in the United States is, is pet cats and feral cats that, that you know, go out and, and hunt. To respond to this cat problem, Tim has taken to capturing any of the cats calling Armand Bayou Nature Center home and taking them to a no-kill shelter. 
I asked him if he had any idea on how they got there in the first place. So, you know, people will, will let their cats go here at Arma. They think, oh, well, he'll be fine. He'll just go eat the birds and, and you know, and the lizards and the snakes. And cats are very self-sufficient and, you know, he should be fine. But I would, I would say, please, please, please don't dump your cat. You know, don't dump your dog. Don't dump your bunny rabbit uh, on, on the side of the road or in a park. Uh, it's it, they, Again, they live a miserable existence, and they are very likely to be preyed upon by, by, um, by predators, and, and they'll, they'll get diseases and things like that. You're not doing your kitty cat a favor by, um, in fact, you're, 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 it's almost worse than taking him to a shelter. So if you must relinquish your animal, I would say take it to a shelter. Um, you know, to, to let it go. Whether cute and cuddly or small and scaly, invasive species have a way of making themselves at home. Hunting pythons in Florida or hogs in Texas may seem extreme, but it's a result of man's careless relationship with animals. Due to the devastation caused by invasive species, it stands to reason why some states take extreme preventative measures. I'm starting to get the impression that there's a whole menagerie of laws limiting pet ownership in the United States. What do you do if you need some actual help in this area? I assume there's more than just this podcast. Definitely. You call a pet lawyer. Is that like a dog that's a lawyer or a lawyer that you keep as a pet? Maybe a lawyer with a little bit more fur on their suit. In my explorations to learn more about pet law, I came across someone whose job it is to litigate pet-related legal cases. I'm Zandra Anderson. I've been a trial attorney for a long time. The last 18 years of my practice, I've devoted to animal law, which I was able to blend profession with passion. I uh, was really burnt out being a trial lawyer because that's stressful and there was a lot of burnout with it. So I just on a whim, sent out an email and asked other animal friends if they might be interested in a Texas dog loss seminar and kitties too. So that's kind of how it launched. Federal laws regarding pets largely focus on the welfare of animals. But as we now know, states can have a whole host of laws regulating the act of pet ownership. In Texas, there are many laws that touch on dog ownership. The majority of cases I have handled deal with dogs because there are more laws relative to dogs because a dog can be deemed dangerous. So when I just, if I tell people, you know, I have a website, texasdoglawyer.com, they're like puzzled. What does that mean? Well, it can mean a variety of things. If your dog accidentally gets out, and you find yourself in an ownership dispute because someone doesn't want to give back the dog, that raises a whole host of laws. There are insurance issues with laws, with whether or not um, certain policies will cover dogs and different breeds of dogs. Uh, there's a host of things you just get, you can't imagine. One thing that interested me the most was how exactly pets are viewed in the eyes of the law. Uh, a domesticated animal, such as a dog or a cat, in all 50 states, they are viewed as property. In property cases, you have the common law, which is case-made law, and then you have statutory law, which are laws made by the state, or it can be laws made by cities and counties regarding ownership of animals. In addition to that, if you live in a homeowner's situation where you have an HOA, a homeowner's association, in addition to whatever laws are out there, you can have regulations that you've essentially agreed to by living there. So there's laws on top of laws on top of regulations and rules. So it's uh, the law is pretty darn complex when it comes to animal law. Because dogs are property, how does it work when your property is lost? And what happens when it's found? In the law, if a person is a finder of lost property, then the finder has superior rights as to all others except the true owner. 
That's the common law for property. So in the case where the dog was found, it did not extinguish the ownership rights of the owner just because the dog got out. In 2016, Zandra fought for the return of a German shepherd named Monty after he got out and was picked up by a dog rescue organization in Houston, Texas. The organization refused to give Monty back to his owners, the Lira family, leading to a years-long fight that culminated in a ruling from the Texas Supreme Court. I think the important thing that the Lira case pointed out is that in property cases in the state of Texas, it says, and I'm going to quote what the Supreme Court said, we also consider as an aid in construction the principle that the law abhors a forfeiture of property. So the Supreme Court recognized that dogs are special property and that they have special value to us. Regardless, they're still property, but they have much more value than a table or a chair, which is easily replaced. And so the, the Supreme Court concluded that indeed there were property rights in this dog that had not been extinguished by any impoundment. In fact, went on to explore the word impoundment, which says that an impoundment is something done by a governmental entity, for example, of, of a car, or in this case, a dog, with an eye to returning that property to the owner. Pets are an important part of our families. It has been that way for a thousand years. If you have ever lost a dog or cat, you know that it can be a very hard experience. From this conversation, I really looked at my own dogs differently. I saw where my rights became closely intertwined with theirs. It also reminded me that as a dog owner, I'm responsible not only for feeding my dog and keeping them healthy, but I'm also responsible for knowing the laws in my area that regulate pet ownership. As was mentioned before, pet laws vary across all 50 states and in every city and county within them. This area of law is quite hairy, if you will. I see what you did there. Well, we've come to the end of our tale. Tale, huh? Eh. Remember to subscribe to Sidebar, and if you like what you hear, maybe drop us a review. You can find us on Twitter at SidebarCNS. And please do visit our website, courthousenews.com, for all your legal news consumption. On the next episode of Sidebar, I don't have a drinking problem unless I can't get a drink. And I only have that problem on Sundays. Blue Laws, the states that have them, the 1,500-year-old books that made them, and the Supreme Court decisions that signed off on them.